right now. So right now we're recording the audio, and this will be uploaded sometime in the next couple of days. Don't rely on this. This is a courtesy. I won't always do it, so don't think this is the thing. Um, we have some uh, students from SAS who require assistance in note-taking, and I had a form I was supposed to pass around. I forgot to bring the form. I'll bring the form again next time. But if, if you're able to share your notes with these students, let me know. Just email me and say you're willing to do so, and I'll add you to the list, and I'll also bring the form around next time. So this is, again, for students who uh, need accommodation, um, helping accessing people's notes. Okay, so that's a generous thing for you to do, and I encourage you to do so. Do we have any questions? from last week, or was it such perfect crystal clarity that nobody has any concerns? Or are we still in the, oh, yes, sir? Of course, with health sciences, people care about assignments, not learning. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about uh, later on today. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's begin then. <laughs> so um, we're going to go over some stuff first. I uh, have some funny things for here. We have, Ever since Shelley first randomized her siblings, she knew she wanted to become a clinical epidocologist. Huh? Huh? Yeah, nothing? Nobody? All right. Looking for new epi jokes. If you find it, let me know, uh, because what exists is pretty bad. Um, okay, so uh, at the end of the semester, as I noted, uh, the big thing that we're going to do is have something resembling a simulated research conference. In the past, it was a physical conference. This year, we're trying something new. It's an electronic conference. You still got to show up. But it involves you and your team members putting together a research poster and presenting it in front of judges. And um, again, in the past, it was a physical poster. This year, it will be a projected poster. Same idea. We'll talk more about it as, as the course unfolds. But here are some uh, ideas for posters I don't want you to do. For example, birds, they're fucking everywhere. Drop it like it's hot. There's something that was... Up, I guess, huh? uh, extreme wood. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I've, I've got some ideas. Notice th these are the old school posters that are made from literally posting things onto cardboard. You can, you could, well, this year it's electronic, but people still do this occasionally. But the in thing now is to actually take a PowerPoint slide and print out a poster on uh, paper or fabric now. Um, I hate my fucking brace. Uh, women, the silent killer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I don't why I chose these. These are not good. These are not good. Okay, so moving on. Remember I ended last class by showing you a few images I wanted to look at. And this is just a taste of risk analysis to get you into the idea of thinking logically, which is relevant for the assignment. Because the assignment is about logical thinking and seeing flaws in reasoning that purports to be research. So this was, uh, again, uh, an image that I took uh, on the subways of Toronto. It's from the uh, uh, CANFA, the Canadian AIDS, something about foundation AIDS research. And it says, uh, if, do you know that 86% of HIV positive Canadians are male, two-thirds of boys aged 15 and 19 are sexually active, you think your kids aren't at risk, think again. All right, so what does that ad make you think, first of all? And be honest. You see that ad, what do you, what's your first impression? as someone who's not trained in epidemiology. Nobody has first impressions? They have zero impressions? Yes, in the back? Okay, that's right. And they might be. So keep in mind that as I present this, I'm not saying people aren't at risk. I'm saying the way that risk needs to be communicated is a little problematic. If you look at the actual numbers, though, did you know that 86% of HB positive Canadians are male? Okay, but how many HB positive Canadians are there? It's not all the males. It's actually a small number. Two-thirds of boys are sexually active. There's an assumption there that sexual activity and HIV are closely related. In Canada, they're not necessarily. It's drug use that's closely related. All right, so all of a sudden, you start to see the conflations of ideas here that are presented epidemiologically to tell a narrative a bit dishonestly. So, did you know that 80% of HIV positive Canadians are male? What's the denominator? It's not all the men in Canada. It's the number of people with HIV in Canada. It's like 58,000 people. Okay, so, 86% of those. So, 49,000 or so males are living with HIV in Canada. That's not the 3 million you may have first thought. Male, not men. 
Okay? So we conflated in the previous uh, image men with males, and they're talking about boys. How many boys are HIV positive? Not a lot. Okay? So youth in AIDS 19 account for 1.5% of all reports. So 1.5% of that number gives us. So we have about 16 million Canadian men with an HIV prevalence rate of 0.3% among Canadian men. So two thirds of boys are sexually active. What kind of sex? You're talking about masturbation? You're talking about homosexual activity, heterosexual, penetrative sex, safe sex, unprotected? Or who knows? Right? You see where I'm going with this, right? So the, the expression of these numbers can be problematic. So here we have some stats. Uh, sex was responsible for 37% of male HIV diagnosis. The rest were drugs and so forth. So suddenly that's less than half. We're getting our numbers coming down dramatically. Overall, then, the problems of paying males from HIV who likely got it from sex is 0.13%. Tiny. So the ad is trying to make a sly connection between a problematic allusion to HIV and the fact that boys might be sexually active. I'm not saying they're not a risk. I'm just saying the risk is definitely not as great as that sign makes it out to be. And of course, I've, I've complained to public health about these things. And they admit they've done wrong. They say, yeah, but it's better to scare people into proper behavior than to express the truth of the numbers. I don't think that's true. Look at this one. This is um, abuse. Uh, approximately three to five children in every Canadian classroom have witnessed their mother being assaulted. 70% of men in court or treatment of violence witnessed as a child. Okay, obviously one child witnessing this stuff is bad. Uh, any man who commits the act, that's a bad thing as well. But the numbers are slyly in inflating a statistic that probably is not as bad as it suggests. So, three to five children, is that a lot? How big are these classes? I don't know. Are there six kids in the class? In which case, that's the majority. Are there 20 kids in the class? In which case, that's a tiny fraction. All right. How many kids not in the classroom witness it? So it reminds me of, um, I was at a dinner, because I'm an asshole, I get fights all the time. So I was at a dinner party once, and a uh, woman was saying, well, she's an anti-porn crusader, and I'm not. And um, she was saying that, did you know that 100% of men convicted of sex crimes have looked at pornography? And my response was, they probably also ate bread, right? So what's the connection there? And of course, I was not, that was not well received. So, but the point there is, what's the control group? <laughs> right, how many men who are not perverts and sex criminals have looked at porn? All of them. So it's a, it's, it's a conflation of statistics, intentionally so. Then there's this. This is one of my favorite things to get to fight over with public health people. Um, this stat tells you about 30% of, uh, of uh, women on first dates have sex on the first date, online dating have sex on the first date, and uh, 77% of them didn't use any protection during these encounters, and so uh, someone said, um, da -da 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 -da, these women are guaranteed to have an STD. All right, it's not a wise behavior. I'm not saying it's wise to do these things, but it's look at the actual measurement of risk. So, um, how would you go about calculating the actual risk? You'd need to know what? You'd need to know how many people in Canada actually have STDs or STIs. Right? You need to know, if you have an STD, what is the probability of actually transmitting it if you have unprotected sex. So we actually have that information. The current prevalence is 164 cases per 100,000 people, or 0.16% of the total population, have the most common kinds of STDs, according to Health Canada. So uh, what does that mean? Well. For men over 25, maybe there are a total of close to 10,000 cases of chlamydia in a given year right, in Canada. Um, I'm assuming these women who are, who are online dating, they're heterosexual and, and uh, they're having random sex with random men. The Canadian adult male population is about 20 million or 30 million. Therefore, the risk of any Canadian male having chlamydia at any given time is about 0.05%. So your chance of being exposed to an STD is actually quite minimal according to this analysis. Is that the end of the story? No, it's not. The transmission rate is quite small. So I'll, I'll skip through all this, get to the point later on. So I, I want that parents open there because of chlamydia, obviously. And if you think of chlamydia, you think of her. I don't know why. So, <laughs> so after doing all the math, you get like a very conservative estimate of a 0.02% chance 
of both being exposed to an STD and receiving an STD if you have random unprotected sex with a Canadian man. Okay? That's definitely not a guarantee of any kind of infection. Again, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying if you happen to do it, chances are you're okay. It's a problematic message. And the problem with the analysis is what? It's on the slide, obviously. It's, um, I've taken into consideration the entire denominator of the Canadian population. Whereas one assumes if you're engaging in these behaviors, you're uh, a, a concentrated uh, population of similarly behaving individuals, maybe the club going population and so forth, and so maybe the statistics are um, more forgiving. So I bring this up because the ways in which we express statistics and risk in population health uh, is often tainted by value and bias, and sometimes that bias is intentional and sometimes unintentional. And I, I have these images here because, you know, my, a lot of my work used to be in the jungles of Guyana. And one year I was um, a, on a mission down there and talking about these computations around sexually transmitted diseases and computations with public health people. And they agree with me. So yes, your math is correct. The chances of getting an STD from random unfit sex in Canada is vanishingly small. However, you should still scare people into taking the appropriate actions to protect themselves, because that's a wise thing to do. While having this conversation, we were standing uh, knee-deep in a river in the Amazon. I was wearing snake-proof boots, and they were not. And there are seven poisonous species of snakes in that area, and a person dies in that village pretty much every year. So I thought, isn't it odd? Isn't it odd that you're, you're okay with risking probable death by standing in a snake-infested river, but you're not okay with risking a curable STD with a vanishingly small risk. I'll just leave that there. <laughs> um, again, the story there is beware of risk perception and computations. It's not the end of the story. You have to dig deeper into what is the denominator. That was a lesson I learned the first day of grad school. So my professors told me, always ask, what is the denominator? Because sometimes you present just numerator data. Uh, there are X cases of this disease. Okay, is that a lot? What's the denominator? Okay. So later on, we're going to talk about relative measures versus absolute measures. If I tell you, and this is true, it's a real case, if I tell you that um, the number, the, the burden of cholera in Ontario in the mid 90s doubled one year, is that alarming? Yes, yeah, alarming, it doubled. Right? This is a true story. And it made the news and everything. What's going on? You know, what actually happened was it went from two cases to four cases. That's a double. It's not a risky thing, though. Two people came back from Mexico on vacation, that's all they could do. So the difference between relative measures and absolute measures and perception of risk. All right. That's that first slide deck done. That was easy. Wasn't that easy? That was fun. All right. Now, what you want to do next? Let's do this one. Interpretation. Epidemiologic literature. This is the meat of today. Okay. Another epi joke. This is actually an actual cartoon from the New Yorker. Uh, it was typically a blue interview driven by an epidemiologist to the party. Always invite an epidemiologist to the party. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. So um, when I first started teaching this class many, many years ago, one of my students was traveling in Kenya and and they gave her a key to her hotel room and happened to have this image on it. She sent me, why is Dr. Gomez on my key? There you go. <laughs> so I show this every year. I show it to him, I'm not mocking him. He knows I do this. And he has no explanation. So it's very mysterious. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, consider this scenario. This is a very attractive young woman. We have a 40-year-old accountant in a short skirt who visits her family physician for a checkup. And her mother has breast cancer. Right, very, very concerning. Uh, and the patient wants advice about what she can do to reduce her own risk of getting breast cancer in the future. And here are her demographics, right? And every, any good doctor finds out the basics. She already has two kids. She's in good health. She has regular menzies. Um, she has a regular pap smear. So everything looks in good condition, but she wants to reduce her chances of developing breast cancer in the future. So what does a physician do? Right, because they're not overtly trained in reducing these kinds of risks beyond simply, hey, have a good lifestyle uh, and have your, your stats be checked out. So in responding to this uh, question, the doctor has to first confirm that 
there is an association between family history and gang disease. I don't know why that image is there. There it is. Okay. And, and, and the doctor looks up in PubMed all the, the risk factors and finds out the end. In fact, we have the early age of pregnancy is associated. Uh, number of pregnancies is also associated with getting breast cancer. But they're not easily fixed. You can't, once you already have that done to you, you can't really do anything about it. So how do you address it? You really can't. It's done already. But the doctor is also aware, from reading literature, that there is maybe an association between how much fat we eat and risk of, of breast cancer. Okay? Um, this back there. There you go. Okay. So, what advice does the doctor give? Based upon that one paper she read, she could tell the doc, tell the patient, you know what, I read this paper, apparently some people say there is a heightened risk of breast cancer if you eat fat, you should reduce your fat. Is that a responsible thing to do? Based on that one paper? I think we ought to read, no, the answer is no. So you read more papers, right? And some say yes, there's a risk, but some say no, there isn't a risk. So what do you do then? Well, you need a systematic method for assessing the quality of that evidence and to reduce it down to a single recommendation. What we're talking about here is the science of the systematic review. And I'm, uh, I think you've all heard the term systematic review already, hopefully in your research methods classes. If you haven't, then this will be an important bit of information for your scientific education. Who has not heard about systematic reviews or how to do them in the past? Great. Review for everyone, fantastic. Now, your project at the end of the semester, the poster assignment, is like a systematic review. It's not really a systematic review. And I tell students every year, don't call it a systematic review because occasionally you get really uptight judges who will see it and say, well, that's not a systematic review, and you called it one, ding, one, mark, reduced. Instead, I, I made up a term for it. I call it a structured literature review, and I instruct the judges. People use that term. This is what it means. So don't back. Now, the thing about a systematic review is it's systematic. There's a machine that we crank that's objective, that's um, uh, assessed at every turn, that's reproducible, and therefore that is beyond our approach when it comes to questioning this methodology. So um, that's what we're talking about today. Okay? So the doctor has to review the pertinent medical literature. What we're talking about here is the application of evidence-based medicine. I know you've heard this term before in other classes. And we're going to go over it again because EBM arises from the best traditions of epidemiology. And it was actually invented, at least a modern version of it, in, uh, in Canada at the Master University in Hamilton. And Sackett was the great god of EBM. I think Sackett's still alive, I'm not sure. Right? So essentially, he said EBM is the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. The best research evidence is what we'll be talking about today. That's the machine of assessing quality and for searching out quality evidence. Clinical expertise is what the doctor or the practitioner brings to the table. They can say, well, hey, the evidence says we should do this and that. However, I know I can't do that responsibly, or the technology doesn't exist for this, or by my own experience, this doesn't apply. And the patient values is what are they willing to do. Let's walk when he comes back. Now he's just stepped up. Um, okay, so oftentimes we, we may find an intervention that is extraordinary, but is contrary to your religion or your belief system or something. So the patient values have to be considered. Right? Maybe we end up recommending that this individual cut off, cut out all sources of fat and maybe cut off her left leg as well. Right? Maybe that's evidence that produces a risk, but she's not willing to do that as contrary to her values. So. It's a way to use medical literature to inform clinical and sometimes policy decision making. And systematic reviews are a, I say big business, it is a business right now here. Government agencies whose job it is just to do systematic reviews. I have two grants right now just to do two systematic reviews. Contrast with the government to produce systematic reviews. It's boring as hell. It's really boring. So you hire grad students to do it. They need the money and I don't want to do it. <laughs> so, to some extent, this is common sense, and to some extent, it is an attempt to overcome ideology. So, I'll tell you a story. Uh, again, when I was in grad school, one of my first jobs was to um, do, a jo do a thing for St. Joseph's Hospital at London, Ontario. And there, they had just done a training program 
of gynecologists to teach them not to do certain practices for pregnant women. So what was happening was they would you know, shave the pubic hair of pregnant women, they would give them enemas, they would make sure that um, um, hygienic uh, environments were present so family wasn't allowed in the room when they're giving birth, etc., etc., etc. Because that was, that's what they were taught in medical school up to that point. The evidence showed us that that makes no difference in terms of healthy outcomes for babies. So their program was to tell the gynecologist to stop doing this, it makes no difference. And my job was to determine whether or not the gynecologist had stopped doing it. And guess what? They hadn't stopped. They kept on doing it. What we concluded was um, quality of evidence is insufficient to actually cause clinical change. What matters is willingness on the part of people to actually look at the evidence and to make positive changes. So even though we're going to present to you the hierarchy of evidence and how we assess evidence and how we present it to decision makers and clinicians, you can't make the horse drink even though you drop them to the water. So this is the problem. Okay, what is best research evidence? And we'll talk about that in a second, but in general it's relevant research that has strong methodology associated with it. Expertise, that's what the doctor brings to the table, and patient values we talked about. And why, as this, uh, you probably noticed, if you haven't noticed because you're so young, but um, throughout your lifetime this has been a big deal. Before your lifetime it wasn't. This is a relatively new thing. It's really taken off in the last couple of decades for a number of reasons. And here are a couple of reasons. Right? So we recognize now that clinicians need lifelong learning. What you learn in medical school doesn't cover the, the totality of what you need to actually uh, uh, have a clinical practice. And what policymakers and government need is regular new information of high quality. Textbooks are outdated. You can't rely on that. You can't rely upon the papers that you read because one paper does not tell the whole story at any given time. CME, that's continuing medical education, that's something required for most um, modern uh, caregivers, are often useless. I know that because I teach some of those CME courses. They're totally useless. So, <laughs> and there are too many journal articles. So um, who's got time to read them all? So some positive developments in the last few years have made this possible. One is we have methodology for doing it, and we're going to do some of that today. We have the systematic review at our disposal, which is now a machine we can crank to produce a high-quality assessment tool. We have specialized journals that don't publish opinions, just publish the best quality evidence. And we have computers. That's a big one. Right? So computers now we can do incredible fast searches of the global literature and reduce it down to a, a, a very small maximum very quickly. And uh, you know, the soft stuff is we have people with the right attitudes. I mentioned the gynecologists um, 20 years ago who weren't willing to change. Today I think they would change because the attitude has changed in regards to how you respond to evidence somewhat. All right. Uh, yeah, it's also cheaper. So um, if this ends up appealing to you. Uh, if there's time left over today, we'll talk a bit about you know, careers in epidemiology. But um, there's a growing demand for expertise and systematic review development and methodology. As I mentioned, there are agencies that just do this. Some of my former grad students, their full-time job now is just cranking out systematic reviews. Um, and it's now bleeding into the social sciences and the humanities. They figure this out as well as a powerful research tool. So it's taking over the world a bit, in large part because it's cheap to do as a form of research. Here are the steps. There's essentially five steps, but we only have two or three of them. So the first step is to convert the need for information into an answerable question. And this, at the professional levels, takes days. At our level, it'll take us minutes, because we don't care that much. But I was involved in one systematic review that was seeking to determine um, the prevalence of mentally ill youth in Ontario. Okay, we had a government contract to do that. It took us weeks to write the research question. Weeks. Uh, a team of experts in a room arguing for weeks. Why we couldn't define mental illness? We couldn't define adolescent. We couldn't even define Ontario. What are the parameters here? These things matter. Right? Step two. We will find the best evidence to answer this question that we just raised. Step three, this is the systematic portion. Well, they're all systematic. We're going to appraise the quality of that evidence and just retain the best ones. Step four, 
and step five can't really do that. So step four is going to integrate that evidence with clinical expertise. At the doctoral level, that's done. At the epidemiology and policy levels, we can't stop here. And step five, we're supposed to have evaluating what went wrong. But to be honest, no one does four and five. Okay, uh, this is a joke slide. Don't you memorize it? This is the jokes here. Okay, so alternatives to EBM, alternatives to evidence-based medicine, eminence-based medicine, where you just listen to whoever's got the most seniority, vehemence-based medicine, that's when your anger is what matters. Eloquence-based medicine, meaning that whoever speaks the prettiest wins. Uh, providence that you got the idea. You can read that. You know. The looks on your face is telling you I should move on. Right, fine. Fine. Okay. What are we searching um, when we are searching the literature for answers? Okay. And, and keep track of, of this methodology because when you do your your uh, your poster assignments. I want you to follow, to some extent, this methodology, to, to the extent that you can, okay? um, because that's how you're going to be judged on the systematic nature of your ability to find information and answer a question. So most commonly, you're going to look for peer-reviewed journal studies. Why? Because the assumption is, if it's been reviewed by your peers, by other scientists, then there's probably nothing profoundly wrong with it. We tend not to want things that come out of newspapers or news reports or lectures or blogs. There is a room for that. There's a role for that. We, we call that gray literature. Gray literature is non-peer-reviewed stuff. There's a role for that in maybe fleshing out some of the ideas, but it's not the core evidence that we want. And we have these last two things here, meta-analyses and systematic reviews, that we can search as well. And these are often published as peer-reviewed studies. Now, these two are not the same thing even though many people will conflate them. Um, let's get back a second. Right, I'll get back to that in a second. Okay. So um, there are all kinds of places now that publish the best evidence. There's a Cochrane Library. Cochrane is an organization that publishes a lot of systematic reviews uh, and so forth and so forth. This is an old slide. Really, pretty much you find this stuff anywhere now. PubMed will have all this stuff too. Okay. And um, you do remember your different types of studies. The RCT, the observational studies, and these two. We tend to like to uh, constrain our searches to the very best designs, and there is a bias in the community that says that if it's not an RCT, it's not worthwhile. I don't agree with that. It depends on the questions that you're asking. For example, if we're looking at the prevalence of mentally, mental illness amongst adolescents in Ontario, there are no randomized controlled trials for that. They're all observational studies. So. You know, we, we uh, exclude ourselves out of all the information if we just look at RCTs. But most of um, the very clinical systematic reviews limit themselves to the very best randomized controlled trials. The double-blinded, placebo-controlled randomized controlled trials, which we will talk about later on in the year. And we call that the gold standard for evidence, even though there's sometimes not. Ah, all right. So uh, I stole some of these slides from Dr. Gomez, and I love Gomez slides because he always has like blanks to fill in, and I don't know what he meant to put in there, so I always guess every year. So some of the fun parts. So formally, we I'm guessing that means question. Yeah, I'm guessing that's okay. Um, you have to define that. I'm guessing that's scope. All right. You have to develop the search strategy. I'm guessing, and conduct literature uh, enema. No search. All right. So that's really what it comes down to. And, um, at, Asking the question is critical. Constraining the scope of your, of your search is critical too because we're going to judge you, and by we I mean not just the judges later this year, but the scientific community on how you constrain your search. If, for example, you say, I'm only going to look at papers published in Hungarian, well, we're going to question somebody, right? Like, why is that? You're going to miss out some important English papers, things like that. So your constraints have to be rational. And your search strategy, what keywords are you using? In what databases? in what combination, and then you actually conduct the search. Okay. The kinds of things you read when reading these papers in conducting literature search, you're looking for the study design. If you cannot identify the study design, something is seriously wrong with that paper, and its quality is, is low. If they're not clear about how they analyze it, and I'm saying, well, this is a t-test, or this is um, you know, a qualitative analysis, something's wrong with that paper. Um, how they interpret their results appropriately in your expert eyes. 
Had they identified biases or limitations in their paper? If not, can you identify them? This is part of the critical appraisal process that you will bring to assessing the quality of the papers that you get. Also in this process of conducting systematic review, it's useful to create a table that summarizes the important things that you want from the papers that you're going to finally use. Things that include who is the study on, what the demographics, what's the sample size, what's the study design, what year is it published in, and what is the important finding that you want taken out of it. Maybe, if you're looking for, in my case, it was the prevalence of uh, mentally ill kids in Ontario, well, paper A says it's 2%, put that in my table. Paper B says it's 6%, okay, and so forth. So that's the important thing I want to take out. So if you can visualize the table that you're going to produce, life gets very easy. And you're going to do that for your poster presentation at the end of the semester. Um, right. And this slide just shows the, um, the kinds of questions you can ask every paper that you find to determine whether or not it is a good paper, critically appraised that paper. And hopefully you've done this already in your critical appraisal course. If you haven't, here's your chance to express those skill sets. And by the way, these are marketable skill sets. I'm fond of saying, yes, ma'am. critical appraisal course is required. Is not required? Yes, yeah, What? Yes, yeah, it's optional. Yeah. <laughs> is math optional now? <laughs> where, where are we in society? Is eating optional? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's a tragedy. I'll tell you why. I think um, uh, Health Sciences is a hilarious program. And I, 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 I love it, but it's, um, the, I believe that the best skills you get out of it, you know, you get communication skills and, and synthesis skills, but you get, I believe, uh, uh, a lot of skills from epidemiology because I'm biased. You get some skills from stats. You get a lot of skills from program evaluation, critical appraisal. That's where the most obviously um, uh, listable, marketable skills are. But even though you haven't got critical appraisal, some of you, you have this, and it kind of covers much of the same stuff. Okay, so consider these questions when assessing the, the quality of your papers. Well, there's more of them, whatever, I'll skip through. All right, this is my terrible example. Uh, the effects of a dietary fat on breast cancer risk. I don't know why I chose these images, but they make me laugh. That's the important <laughs> part. So, first step is, when we're conducting our search, we're going to ask a question, the research question. Hopefully, you've seen the PICO model before. Have you? Yes, most people? Excellent. Let's move over again. PICO model is not the only one you can use. There are several other models, but we're going to push the PICO model because it's the most common one, it's the most useful one. Often, it's not relevant for qualitative research. Like the qualitative research sometimes you like, you know, what are the, you know, the opinions of people on blah? Or what, you know, that kind of stuff. But this is a very specific mathematical, clinical uh, um, distillation of a question. And of course, PICO stands for Patient Population Intervention Comparison and Outcomes. Right? Uh, and we like to as well sometimes determine or make a note of the kind of question you're asking. Um, are we asking a question to help us therapeutically? Are we asking a question to help us about diagnosis? or about for prognosis, the outcome of, of this patient, or about whether there's harm here. So the two that I'm on, I'm in, oh my, I'm in two right now for clients. One of them is looking qualitatively at the barriers that Aboriginals face when it comes to medical education in Canada. I've got uh, two glasses looking at that. And we have another one we're doing for the government on the cost effectiveness and clinical effectiveness of a particular class of drugs. So those would be, those would be what? The first one would be prognosis, uh, and the second one would be, I have no idea. So sometimes they're actually fit well. Okay? But those are the kinds of systematic reviews that we do in real life. Oftentimes they'll fit naturally in a given category. The people is important. So here's another example we can start with. Uh, a new patient presents with mid-upper right abdominal pain. She's 47, no uh, past medical history. She's nauseous but not vomited. She has no change in her bowel movements. That's great. Uh, on physical examination, she is very tender and uh, we have ordered x-rays. So we've given her antacids, the pain is not relieved. We are worried that giving her opioids will interfere with our ability to diagnose the problem. So what's the PICO question we're going to ask literature? Uh, we have patients with acute pain, that's our key. We're going to give them narcotics, opioids. We're not comparing them to anybody except maybe people who aren't getting opioids. The outcome is, are the narcotics affecting diagnosis? 
And this is a diagnostic question. The type of study is an interesting one. In this case, we have constrained our search just to RCTs. Again, that's typical, especially for a really clinical question. So most medical questions will rely strictly on RCTs because they're the best ones. But when you do yours, you can open it up to observational studies. You can even open it up, if you like, to, to opinion pieces and commentary. That's your choice. You have to justify it. I will say, one of the caveats to doing a systematic review, a good one, is to be able to justify every choice that you make. A judge may ask you, or a paper reviewer may ask you, why have you constrained your search to papers 1975 and above? Why have you constrained to English only? Why have you looked at only RCTs, etc., etc., etc.? You have to have a reason for them. Sometimes that reason is, that's all I could afford, and that's a valid reason. Sometimes the reason is, I can't speak any language other than English, so I have to re that's a fine reason. Just have a reason. And the reason you need a reason <laughs> is that allows us to assess whether the systematic nature of your systematic review was rational. And that allows us to place it on a scale of quantity. Okay. So again, as a, as a result of this PICO, the question we get is, in patients with acute abdominal pain, does the use of narcotics affect our ability to diagnose the problem. Right. Now let's do it for the breast cancer and dietary fat question. Our patient population, adult women, we could have said adult Caucasian women, we could have said adult Caucasian American women, but it depends on the choices that you're making here. Um, why have we chosen adult women and not the, the ones that gave this now? For a clinical reason. It's not relevant that she's Caucasian. It's not relevant that she's American. These things are affect her metabolism in this way. It is relevant that she's a she and she's an adult. The intervention here is dietary fat. There's no comparison group except people who don't eat uh, dietary fat. It's a choice. Outcome, breast cancer, and we'll take any kind of study. So our question is, in adult women, is dietary fat a risk factor for breast cancer? When we do the review, we must answer the question. A lot of people forget to answer the question. Sometimes the answer to the question is, the question cannot be answered. But addressing the question is critical. Otherwise, why did you do it in the first place? So when I uh, assess uh, systematic reviews, especially student ones, the first thing I look at is, did they answer the question? It's amazing how many times they don't. Okay, and here's some, um, once you do literature search, uh, here are some of uh, the things that pop up. Influence of a very uh, high vegetable diet, blah, 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 blah. blah. Here's one on uh, from informer, oh, dietary measurement, whatever. So there's lots of stuff. Notice that some of these papers find a significant relationship between dietary fat and breast cancer. What does significant mean? It means different things to different people. Um, when a journalist talks about significance, they're usually talking about emotional significance or uh, someone's opinion that it's significant. When a scientist is talking about it, we're usually talking about statistical significance. But there are three kinds of significance. There's statistical, clinical, and biological. When you do a review, you've got to be clear in your mind, what do you care about? Usually we care mostly or entirely about statistical significance. In other words, um, the findings happened um, probably not due to chance. And a statistical test was done, a t-test, a task, whatever it might be. Clinical significance is about is do our results allow us to change clinical practice? Often it doesn't matter that there is a, 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 a statistically significant change. For example, maybe we find that this new drug um, treats infection statistically better than a placebo. That's great. But you know what? We already have a good drug for that. So this drug, new drug, gives us no change in our behavior. So while it is mathematically significant, it's not personally significant to my medical practice. So I don't really care. Biological significance may tell us something about um, a profound finding. That's not statistically or mathematically interesting, but it's intellectually interesting. That sort of moves the dialogue further. So depending on the question you're asking, you have to think about the kind of significance that you care about. This is the pyramid of evidence. And maybe you've seen something like this before, I hope you have. We, we tend to have a similar thing most instructors have a similar way of looking at this, and it changes from person to person. But in general, we think that things higher up on the pyramid are better study designs than things at the bottom of the pyramid. So in general, we think um, 
people's opinions are low on the bottom. Uh, animal research is probably low. Things that are done on cell cultures, that's a low quality evidence. It's the beginning of wisdom. All these observational studies are somewhere in between. And the very best studies are, as I mentioned, for randomized controlled trials. And even better than that is a systematic review based on randomized controlled trials. This is debatable. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, right? And, and the reason for that is um, one could argue that the differences between animals and humans is greater than the difference in quality between an observational study and a randomized controlled trial, even if an RCT was done on animal study. For example, we can cure everything in a rat. Rats are pretty much immortal now, but none of that stuff is translatable to humans, almost none of it. Right? So um, it doesn't tell us a whole lot. Okay? Uh, one of my favorite stories about that was someone that saying, you know, I saw uh, someone do a study where they put um, HIV virus in a test tube um, with vitamin C and it killed the virus. How come vitamin C is not a, a cure for HIV? And my response was, you can put HIV virus in a tube with the urine and it will kill it. It doesn't mean urine is it. <laughs> so once you get things down to the animal and cellular level, things are a lot easier than in the whole body human. Good question, though. Like I said, these are debatable. right? In general, we tend to agree on the generals that opinions are low, observations are in the middle, and RCTs are on the top. And there are times when definitely an animal research can move up. So the, the quality of animal study is often better than an opinion. However, having seen this thing, keep in mind that even though we all agree, to a large extent, that this is the way that um, quality evidence should be ranked, the way the world works is in reverse. If you want to get something done, if you want to pass legislation, if you want to get a politician's opinion, uh, attention or journalist's attention, what they care about is the quality of opinions. And you can tell them all about the very best systematic reviews and their eyes will glaze over and what, what, I don't understand what, right? But if, oh, Dr. Such and Such, who's a big shot, says this is what the truth is. Oh, well, in that case, that must be the truth. So recognize that even though this is objective epidemiological hierarchy, it doesn't translate to the real world policy of people. Okay, moving on. Oh, this is my, um, my version of the pyramid is this. Um, it's at an angle because I couldn't fit it on here, that's the only reason. And if you, if you get my crappy book, it's on here as well, right? So at the bottom, expert opinion, um, ecological studies, we'll talk about later on, are there, observational studies, very much control trials, and systematic review. There are some experts, I think they're right about this, who argue that a really, really well designed, very good RCT is probably better than a systematic review. Again, it's a it's personal choice. It's a debatable thing. That's what nerds argue over. All right, so the outcome variables. What do we care about? What things are we going to extract from these papers when answering our question about dietary fat and, uh, and breast cancer? Um, uh, there are possibilities, right? We can, we can get things out of death certificates. That's very common. Okay, so uh, a lot of cheaply done, um, pretty powerful epidemiological studies use these public data, data sources. Death certificates obviously are only for dead people, okay? so we don't get the living breast cancer individuals. Um, Self-reports are interesting, so people will, will tell you, well, I've been eating fat all my life, and you know, whatever. Is that, but we, we, as we were last time, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of bias associated with that, there's a lot of free call bias. Medical records are more accurate, even medical records are problematic because the different things that different doctors might write down will change. The words that they use will change. As we saw last time, oftentimes, if you're more concerned about your health, you're going to spend more time with your doctor and have a more complete record and be less concerned. So there's bias built in there as well. Then we have the histopathologic diagnosis, the actual tests that come out of the laboratory. They're probably the best, right? but oftentimes you don't have as many samples as we need. So all of these data sources have problems associated with them. And when you do a systematic review, oftentimes you have to decide, are we going to take all of these sources or just one? Okay. So uh, things aren't straightforward. Oh, blank. Come my slide. The blank is the risk factor for exposure under investment. I think that's something in my training called the primary explanatory variable. Right there. Ooh, that, yeah. So sometimes, um, when we ask these questions, we have in our mind, we're looking for one thing. 
But really, in real life, that one thing associates with other things. Maybe it's not just dietary fat. Maybe it's dietary fat and salt intake. Dietary fat, salt intake, and um, years of occupation, whatever it might be. Okay. So we care about all of them, even though in our mind we're focusing mostly on dietary fat. But we have to have an open mind to collect these other variables as well that may interact. Blank are important because they can provide quantitative documentation of exposure, risk factors, oh, covariates, yeah. <laughs> So a covariate is a risk factor that's not the primary risk factor variable. So how this works is, again, if I'm saying that there's a relationship between dietary fat and breast cancer, it doesn't do that job alone. It does it maybe with salt. Maybe it affects older women more so than younger women. In that case, we have these other covariates. They vary in coordination with the primary explanatory variable. It's a mathematical thing. And um, it's useful when you build larger statistical models to understand how these other variables are playing into it. Yes. Okay. I don't want to make this a stats class, but it's important that we have some basic understanding of uh, the way that statistics is reported. So there are really simplistic interpretations of something that p-value was less than 0.05. Anyone want to take a shot at what it means to have something that with a p-value that people who are in my stats class? Yeah, look away from me. Yeah, come back. What does that mean? How, how, would, you, how would you say p, uh, p equals 0.04? What does that mean? <laughs> That's right. Okay, so yeah, a typical. I don't expect you to know because who? I mean, who cares about this stuff except nerds, right? And, um, and the rule of thumb is if the p is low, you toss out the null hypothesis. What does low mean? Eh, right? Rule of thumb: less than 0.05. There's no reason for that. That's historical convention. In general, we tend to say if it's less than 0.001, which is usually the case, but 0.05 is our cutoff. Um, the actual philosophical interpretation is this. In the event that the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability that the results that I'm seeing are in fact true? If it's low, then we know that then in my scenario, um, the null does not apply. Doesn't matter. I just put it out there if you understand that there's a philosophical component to this. I don't expect you to know that. Just remember, if the P is low, the null must go. Bah, 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 bah. Okay. You have to check for bias. We did bias last time. So all the papers that you collect, assess them for are they biased. Do all the wonderful things we talked about last time. Remember that, um, that great uh, coffee and pancreatic cancer study, right? There's that built-in bias that gave us a faulty reading. If you have that, that level of ascertainment in your head, then you're ahead of the game. The assignment that you're working on is just that, is looking at these studies and trying to figure out what is, what is wrong here. Because there is something wrong, in short. Okay. You're going to interpret your results. You're going to identify the magnitude of the effect. Right? Because that is effect size. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. I'm going to list things. Listing things is boring. Let's get to that stuff. Let's get to... All right. We have got to the revealing the results of the, of the lit review. Okay. I'm guessing that you've got, like, you know, Tobasa hanging there. That's the wrong word to use. So we have, from our lit review, we have uh, some correlational studies that are showing that there is a relationship between what you eat and uh, breast cancer occurrence in various countries. You have what looks like a linear relationship between how much fat you eat and your likelihood of having breast cancer. The problem is that they are ecological studies. What's an ecological study? Okay. An ecological study, we'll talk more about this in the future, is when the unit of analysis is a group and not a person. Do I have slides for that? Let me see here. Yeah, I do. All right, there's a good slide for it. Here we have various, country, various uh, countries here, and we're looking at the homicide rates of these countries and the gun ownership rates in these countries. Looking at this, it looks like there is Yes or no for a relationship between how many guns you own and how much homicide there is, right? That's an ecological study because it doesn't tell us anything about the individuals in those countries. 
doesn't mean if you own a gun, you're going to kill somebody, you're going to die. It just means that, on average, in those countries, those are large numbers. And if you have ecological studies, you have something called the ecological fallacy. And I think of the ecological fallacy is uh, it's a kind of bias which is kind of like racism. It's, it's assuming that an individual represents the qualities of that person's group. So think of this way. Think of, we can do, this is a real ecological study. They looked at communities in Ontario, um, and they looked at the asthma rates in those communities, and they also looked at the farm animal density in those communities. So communities with more farm animals had lower rates of asthma. This is true. It's a real study. Okay, that's an ecological study. From that, you probably suggest that there's something about being around farm animals that lowers your risk of asthma, and there actually is. However, because the study looked at population averages, it tells us nothing about individuals who live there. So if you pull some kid from you know, downtown Durham, Ontario, the so farming community, and say, you must own two cows, because on average everybody in your country, you know, no, I don't like to live in a you know, condo in Main Street. Right? So you can't say anything about individuals, and that's the ecological fallacy. And the examples I gave you here, these correlational studies, are full of ecological fallacies. So we can't really extract anything from them. Okay? Stereotypes are a form of ecological fallacy. It assumes that groups are homogenous, everyone has the same characteristics as the groups, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Uh, good study. I said a lot already. Okay. Uh, okay. So the thing with ecological studies, and again, we'll talk more about them in the future, because they're, they're kind of like an experiment, but not, is that they are cheap, they are easy, and they are fun. And I have a lot of students who do ecological studies for the projects because it's easy. And one student who looked at, um, uh, this is a fourth year student that did a really good job. We get, we get all this stuff published as well. One was on organ donation rates and GDP of American states. We found that as GDP levels go down, so do organ donation levels. Profoundly linear relationship. Like I published recently, it's pretty easy. Another student looked at um, insurance rates, again in U.S. states, and the rates of large for gestational age babies. And we found that the less insurance there was, the more likely your baby was overweight. Again, easy publication. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean that, hey, if you live in one of these states, you're a fat kid. Right? It just means that there's something suggestive about these relationships that warrant more investigation. So ecological studies are great for asking more questions. It's wrong to actually conclude things from them. Yes, ma'am? Um, No, we're talking about, in the case of, of you know, my students' work, we're looking at the U.S. states. So the state of Nebraska, the state of New York, it might be. And here we're talking about the countries themselves, right? Sweden is the group, Spain is the group. So we get the gun ownership rate within that country, homicide rate within that country. I could, for example, I could compare classes that you vote and look, is there a relationship between uh, and, 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 um, uh, e.g. scholarship rates, how many students actually have scholarships, and the percentage of women in each class. Okay? And we may find that the classes with more women tend to have more scholarships. We may find that. It doesn't mean if you're a woman in my class, you've got a scholarship. That, that's the nuance here. Right? And it's, it's obvious for me to say so, if you, and you're smart enough to understand that, but a lot of people don't get that nuance. So we can't conclude anything but individuals, especially if, in a clinical scenario, you're coming to a doctor for assistance on your personal individual situation, and they present you ecological data, and say, well, according to these averages, well, no, no, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not an average. Right? Oh, <laughs> look on your face. No, right. <laughs> okay, there's something called the exception fallacy, which is like the ecological fallacy, but the opposite. This is when you make assumptions about the group from observations of the individual. So the example I've got here is you know some Asian kids who are good at math who doesn't. This is a great stereotype. Well, then all Asian kids must be good at math. <laughs> so there's a bit of racism involved there too. It's stereotyping. Uh, um, it's a, a little bit like selection bias. You select individuals assuming they are representative of, of the whole. Right, so there's a relationship there, it's not entirely sure, that exception fallacy. That's what that's called, and the other one's called the ecological fallacy. Right, back to breast cancer. Ah. 
Well, that's a large scale. Exactly. Okay. Do we have enough information to inform the patient? All this talks about is the outcomes from the studies. Okay. What do we do with all this? We do our systematic review. We summarize all our information in such a way that we can answer our research question. Okay. A systematic review is a synthesis of all the research on a particular subject. That's what we've been doing so far. The systematic aspect of the review comes in various phases. It's how we phrase the question, and I mentioned that a lot of work goes into phrasing the question, and the inclusion exclusion criteria, that's critical, that's an important part of the systematic process, and deciding on which variables to collect. When you do your systematic review, or the thing that we're going to call a structured review, it's advisable to think about a flow chart, saying, I use these search terms, but I got these papers here. I applied my inclusion exclusion criteria, and this is what's remaining after these ones were left out. After I read these papers, I decided that only a subset were actually relevant to my needs, right? And this is what I ended up with after all of this. At each level here, there's a systematic loss of information. That's the systematic nature of the review. And all this must be transparent. Why? Because the nature of the methods of science is that if you are transparent sufficiently, anyone who reads it should be able to do exactly what you did and get exactly the same results. That's why transparency is important. On the other hand, if you were to do a traditional literature review, saying, you know, I read some papers and the gist is that eh, dietary fat causes cancer. I don't know if I can reproduce that. I may read different papers from you. I may get a different finding. If you make it systematic, there's a very high chance I will find exactly what you found. And if I don't, then one of us screwed up. So that's why this is so critical. Examples. If you go to these websites, you will see some examples. So CADF is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. They actually employ a lot of health sciences grads. Uh, some of my grad students work for them. They, their entire job, they're a government agency, um, the government of Canada asks them questions, and they must answer the questions. Like, is this drug cost effective? Is this diabetes technology um, useful for Ontario given our current situation. And they will do a systematic or hire an outside to do one. The Cochrane Collaboration is a global organization of scientists that puts together systematic reviews on a host of topics. They're probably the, uh, the world leaders, systematic reviews, and, and uh, it's going to tell you some things. I realize I'm recording, so I shouldn't put things on, on the record, so I'll, I won't tell you that story. <laughs> it involves an ex-girlfriend, so that way. <laughs> okay, so um, I mentioned that people tend to conflate systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and they're not the same thing. A meta-analysis is when we take the data from all the studies that we found, and we combine them in a statistical way. A systematic review is what I just showed you. It's systematically searching literature for information. The best systematic reviews have meta-analyses, but they don't have to. Some meta-analyses are parts of systematic reviews, but they don't have to be. So these are different things. Don't conflate them. Okay. Now, meta-analyses typically are statistical. I'm going to show you examples in a second, but they don't have to be as well. So I'm doing a qualitative meta-analysis now. One of my grad students did a narrative synthesis. Well, a narrative synthesis is when you look at the papers and you qualitatively say, well, this one, the narrative it goes in this direction, and this one, the narrative goes in that direction. As a whole, they're telling this story. That's a narrative synthesis. The qualitative systematic review is more like um, extracting the text from a variety of papers, mining the text, and getting themes emerging from it. I know it's a lot of stuff in general. Put that stuff aside. In epidemiology, we do numerical meta-analyses, and that's what we'll talk about now. One of the most common ways of expressing the results of a meta-analysis is the forest plot. Has anyone seen the forest plot before? Good, a few of you have, that's great. So, again, reviewed for a lot of you. You can read about it here if you want. It looks like this. The thing about a forest plot is this. Every line represents the outcome data from that study. So here we have a uh, Maki study and uh, two box studies and the column study, right? The width of the line tells us the amount of error in that reported study. This is some outcome measure. Usually it's a relative risk or an odds ratio or maybe a probability estimate. 
And if you don't know those things are, we're going to do that again in this class. We're going to compute relative risk and odds ratios again. And the black part here, the box, is the actual magnitude of that measurement, the relative risk of the odds ratio. So we talk about the, the uh, effect size. The effect size is this, it is the magnitude of that measurement. And again, the width is the error. Usually, with these kinds of measurements, there is a value that tells us that the null hypothesis has not been rejected. For an odds ratio, what is that number? Remember? A relative risk. Remember that number? Anything involving a ratio is a magic number that tells us nothing is going on. Do you remember? It's one. Okay? Uh, a ratio is dividing two things. If I divide two things and they're the same, I'm going to get one. Therefore, if at any time the width of these measurements intersects with one, I know that that study did not find a significant result. For example, my Hannon study over here, this is the width of their, I'm assuming it's an odds, odds ratio, it includes one, therefore that study is not significant statistically. This study was significant. Even though it had a very wide error, it's all significant. This one has a very small error, but it overlaps the one, so their finding was not significant. So what we do with this, we have all these studies now that met our search criteria. Some of them, most of them are significant, one, two, three of them touch the one, and they're not. What do we do? How do you, how do you summarize that? You could say, hey, the majority of my studies saw significance, and a couple didn't. That's not very useful. The meta-analysis allows us to summarize all of this into one global estimate. I do not require you to do meta-analyses. It's an advanced statistical technique. In fact, no one actually does it anymore. There's software online you can look at that does it for you. Just recognize that when you read one of these systematic reviews, the diamond here represents the summary estimate of all of these effects. So this diamond, the width of it is the error and the estimate. So here we have the summary here is uh, odds ratio 0.4 and the error is that width over here. And it is significant because it does not touch the one. So with me? Excellent. So, what, so this is the kind of thing your patient wants to hear about. Well, you've got a, Odds ratio of four, which is actually protective against breast cancer. Okay. Um, I don't know why all this is there. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Let's go ahead. Here we, again, same thing here. Um, the width of various studies, and look at this though. The summary estimate does touch the one. So what, I, what do I conclude from that? What do I tell my patients from this systematic review? Is there a relationship between, let's say, dietary fat and cancer, or isn't there? There isn't, because my summary estimate touches the one. So with me? Excellent. Right. Now, how are we going to assess the quality of these meta-analyses? There are a few things, a few new concepts that I want you to think about. Kappa, we are going to look at later in the year. A kappa statistic is a measurement of agreement. In the past, some students have computed kappa agreements for their final project. I don't require it. Essential value addedness. What a kappa statistic is, it tells us how much different judges agree on something. The example I always give every year is uh, American Idol, right? And in the first round of American Idol, they, they decided whether or not they're going to move on to the big show in, in L.A. So they meet them in, in Kansas and New York, and only five of them will move on to L.A. So 20 contestants show up, and there are three judges, and one judge says yes, and says no, whatever it might be. So the measurement, the question is, how much do these judges tend to agree? A kappa statistic is a way for us to determine how much these judges tend to agree. How is it relevant here? In a true systematic review, you search for papers, you find some papers, you assess whether or not they are relevant to your question. Sometimes there's going to be disagreement. One of you and members of your team will say, oh, this is a great paper, this belongs in a study. They'll say, no, it's not, it's a crappy paper. And, and you'll need a third judge to say, you know, I think that first person's right, it's a good paper, it belongs in. And so sometimes you want to know, as a reader of systematic review, how much did you agree? If there was strong disagreement, then I questioned, um, you know, the, the final set of papers you landed upon. If there's 100% agreement, that's great, everybody agrees. So a capital statistic tells us how much concordance or agreement there is between judges or raters or readers. 
We will compute capital later in the semester. We have these last two now. Now, I do not require you to know how to compute these. I want you to know what they are, though, and how to interpret them. So, they are measurements of heterogeneity, by which I mean how different the papers are. We don't want a lot of heterogeneity. If papers are too heterogeneous, that means our methods for conducting meta-analysis get more complicated. In fact, if there's extreme heterogeneity, we can't really do a meta-analysis. We have to do other kinds of narrative approaches. So that's what we like to look at. And by, and by different, I mean in their study design, in their sample size, in the kinds of outcome variables they use. Because right? if you do a search, you're not going to find two identical papers. There are going to be differences in them. How different are they? Let's just look at them. So Q is called Cochrane's Q. It's a test of heterogeneity. So in general, if it is, it has a p-value associated with it. If the p-value is low, then there is high heterogeneity. The actual value of Q doesn't matter that much. It's kind of like a chi-square. So look for the p-value. Again, if it's significant, that means there's high heterogeneity. I squared, on the other hand, you can compute I squared from Q. In fact, I may ask you if I give you the Q to compute an I squared based on this formula, and vice versa. If I give you the I squared, give me the Q. And it tells us the percent variability across my sample of papers. In general, 25% is low, 50% is moderate, moderate, 75% is high, and that's a qualitative judgment here. And an important distinction between the two is that my Q statistic varies with the total number of studies I have in my review. The I squared does not. So the I squared is robust against sample size. It's an important distinction. I'll say it again. Q varies with the number of studies that I have. I squared does not. So why do we care? Again, I'll say it again. We care about Q and I squared because we need to know how different our studies are and that level of differentness informs me on what kind of meta-analysis I can perform. So this is an example. Here we have um, uh, the results of my search. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six studies. Right, the outcome, the mortality, how many people drop out, right, whatever. Um, odds ratios are the thing I'm looking at. This is the sample size from each one. Right. Um, Right. Oh, sorry, each of these is, is, is a systematic review. I'm sorry. Each is, so this systematic review has 55 uh, papers in it. This one's got 135, et cetera. So here we've got the Q value for it and the P value for each one. So this one, according to Q, is that heterogeneous or not? The P value is not low, so in fact it's a fairly homogeneous set. For this one, on the other hand, the P value is low, therefore this is a fairly heterogeneous set. So the p-value here refers to q. Now my i squared tells me the percentage of papers that are probably problematic. So this one has a very high percentage. Not surprising, given that q is also significant. So it has high variability. I want my p to be low. I want I want my i squared to be low. I want my p to be high. It's still with me. People kind of blazing over here. All right, stop talking soon. Uh, all right. So that's a final example. We have. Um, uh, a systematic review with heterogeneity measurement with a uh, forest plot and so forth. I want you to be comfortable reading systematic reviews. It will be useful in your careers and for your poster assignments, doing something similar but not as extreme as this is recommended. I think we have time for the last lecture, don't we? What time is it? So, we have time. Let's get out of here. Can we take a break first? Break time? Plow through? Okay, it's probably fantastic. That's what I want to hear. All right, this is really this is a fun, fun way to end off today. Yeah, obviously, what I think is fun is different than what you think is fun. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'm going to finish by talking about is is some theories about database management and a little bit about careers in epidemiology. Uh, before I do that, I, uh, any questions about the assignment? I think I've, I've talked a bit about it so far. Do you need more clarity? Yeah? Uh, I think you told us, like, Bill's just talked about research and then Bob's things about 
Oh, it's got to be the first. I have to work first. 31st is the mis- misprint. Yeah. Okay, it's, you've seen it, right? It's pretty fast. You should be able to do it in like half a day. And there are word limits on there to prevent you from writing too much. Because it's possible to write everything you know for every question. Just write the relevant thing. Yes? Is it just one type of bias for each question? Each question has a st- is looking for something specific. Now, if you, if you get something else that's right, I'm open to that, right? I mean, like, if, if you find something profoundly wrong that I missed and you didn't get the thing that's obvious, okay, yeah, I'll give you a question for that. Um, but in general, it's looking for one thing each question. And I don't need the name of it. If you, if you describe what's going on, that's good enough. Yeah, clear on it? Every year, people ask the same questions, but every year it works out fine, so I'm not... To her. Now, I've given away the fact that the same question last year. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk more about it again next week. Maybe give us some thought. I recommend you start now. So don't worry about it from you know, end, of our, end of November. Okay, so um, let's talk about this now. Uh, data, looking at data, is a critical component to this. And no matter what you end up doing in your careers, you're going to have to look at some kind of data, look at a spreadsheet analyze something or other. So understanding the terminology and not being afraid of data on a computer screen is kind of important. Um, I mentioned last time the kinds of software that's available for doing epidemiological analysis. And there's new stuff every single day. One of the, the, the original superstars of this is something called EpiInfo. This was developed by CDC. And it's free. I think that website still works. I'm not sure. It's been a year since I tried. But EpiInfo was invented for developing world countries who couldn't afford um, Microsoft Access and SAS and SPSS. And EpiInfo is powerful enough that you can create surveys, um, data intake screens, it does easy computations and things like that. And it's free. If you want to download it and play with it and do it for your own research, you're welcome to do so. But I remember I was, um, I was on a contract once to a particular country and I had to train their healthcare workers on how to use EpiInfo because Microsoft Access was not available for them. So after a week of training them, I meet with um, the local uh, head clinician of this particular facility, and he wants me to train him as well. I said, well, this is very similar to Access. He says, oh, I have Active Access. He has all the Microsoft products. Right? So I was trained there for no particular reason. They could have just copied the Microsoft products. <laughs> so very quickly, even though people spend a lot of time creating these open access things, the price of the commercial stuff fell, and there isn't a whole lot of need for this anymore, but be aware it does exist. And check it out if you want. This is, a, this is what it looked like a couple of years ago, like, like an 8 bit computer game from the early 90s. Right? But you can do basic stats, you can uh, do some mapping stuff, you can analyze data, you can visualize data, and so forth. And it looks kind of like this, right? So um, every entry on the screen, and so forth. SAF is the big boy. What happened to the, the lights just go off? No? Am I having a stroke? <laughs> I'm old, but it does happen. Okay, so SAS is the big boy. It's, uh, it's the major computing platform for most large-scale epidemiology and population health. Um, this university, our, our, our epidemiology department, teaches and uses SAS as a primary choice. Most epidemiology schools in North America rely on SAS. Most companies rely on SAS. So my first real job after my PhD was consulting to the U.S. federal government through a consulting company in Washington, D.C., and they had an entire building filled with SAS programmers. All they did was program in SAS all day, which is frustrating for me because I was trained to program. I wanted to do my own program. No, not allowed to do my own programming. We have programmers for that. As a result, I've forgotten how to program in SAS. Not fun. But if you want to learn SAS, you can get um, uh, student versions of it and start digging around. And it's, it's pretty frustrating. Uh, that's what it looks like. It has a GUI now. So it looks kind of like SPSS, and the output looks like that. Sudan um, is not a geographical location in this case. It's a version of SAS that's specialized for large-scale survey analysis. So all the big data uh, dumps you get out of the U.S. and Canada around things like uh, um, the Canada Health Survey tells us that 24% of Canadians are not diabetic. That's a Sudan analysis that comes out of our very large surveys. SPSS, you know what that is. That's what we use all the time. 
It's tailor-made for social sciences. And the reason that we teach it to you is because we have a license. No other reason. Right, so we pay for it for labs, so we've got to use it. <laughs> uh, if you, I, I, I like it a lot because it's easy and point click now. If you want a free version, there's a free version called PSPP. That's right. All they will flip over the like this PSPP. You can download that. It's open access. It has nothing to do with SPSS, but it emulates it closely. So you are free to download that and try it. There are two kinds of data. This is a uh, review of your stat class, if you forgot everything. Continuous and categorical. It's important to keep them separate in your minds. Continuous data are things like blood pressure, temperature. It's like a river. Right? You poke your hand in and there's more wet stuff there. Whereas categorical data is discrete data. We can go from continuous to categorical. For example, age to age group. If I ask you your age, you can say 24 or 23 or something, or 23 and a half, or 23.42, whatever. Those are all valid ages. On the other hand, age group would be 18 to 25, 26 to 30, whatever it might be. I can go from age to age group quite easily. If I have all of your ages, I can then recode. If you're 23, then, are, then have a, a check mark for all of you under 25. If I know you're under 25, I cannot then assume you're 23. So I can't go from here to there, but I can go from here to there. So going from continuous to categorical, we lose information. Why would I ever want to do that? You probably know this in the surveys that you've done, sometimes I'll ask you for your birth date, or your age, or your age group. And I said age group is less information, but why would they do that? Yeah? Is there a large scale? Sorry, say it again, please. No, that's not it. It has to do with meaning. Oh, was I ahead? Yeah. Exactly. So if you're a bouncer at a, a club or something and you're, people want to get in, you can ask them, what's, what's your age, what's your age, what's your age? Or you can say, are you under 19? Are you under 19? Because that's what they care about. They don't care if you're 50 or 12, only can you vote. Right? So that's the meaningful thing. Or if we're going to vote, are you over 18? Are you over 18? If you've got to drive, are you over 16? The actual numbers don't matter otherwise. So, that's when we would have age cutoff. So a good way to look at the quality of a study is to say, did they ask for groupings or pure data? Pure data is always better. So a dichotomous variable has two levels, like sex, male, female. Okay? Or sometimes uh, age group, over 18, under 18. Trichotomous levels, three groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We can convert from non-dichotomous to a dichotomous state, like going from patient ages to older and younger than 50, that kind of thing. As, as discussed, we do so if we have need for meaning. Why? Because sometimes there's meaning attached to it. Um, you, you remember the levels of measurement from your stats class? Nominal and ordinal and all that fun stuff. So nominal is when we have names or groupings, like what province were you born in, BC or Ontario or whatever. Typically, you cannot rank nominal things. It's not proper for me to say Ontario is better than Quebec, even though it is, right? So it's <laughs> but what I can do, though, is count the number of people in each category. So the, the kinds of math I can do with nominal variables is very limited. On the other hand, ordinal variables are things that have order associated with it. On a scale of one to five, how do you feel today, right? Three or five is, so where five is better than four and four is better than three. The problem there is, I don't know if the distance between 5 and 4 is the same as the distance between 4 and 3. Or a Likert scale, you know, how, how is this class? Is it uh, excellent, adequate, crappy, or atrocious? Right? The distance between excellent and adequate might be different from the distance between adequate and atrocious. So these are not good kinds of variables, but sometimes we have them. Right? So age is continuous, age group is categorical and ordinal, distance continuous, and so forth. I'm not going over this in depth because you've covered this already. I just want you to be aware of these things because it affects the kinds of analyses you can perform on various kinds of data. You can't do all kinds of math on all kinds of variables. I can't compute an average state that you're born in. I can only say the numbers of people born in each one. I can't compute an average happiness score because um, ordinal variables don't permit that. All right. 
I remember the interval and ratio distance difference. Remember that? Remember those? Yeah. Like a real zero. Exactly. So both of these are continuous variables, but ratio has a real zero. What's a real zero? Well, if you look at the Fahrenheit temperature scale, what's freezing in Fahrenheit? You know? Are Americans here? Freezing is, yeah? 32. Why? Who knows? Makes no sense, right? So what does zero mean in Fahrenheit? It means 32 degrees below zero. Why? Who cares? Makes no sense. So zero has no, no special meaning. It's just a number. Whereas zero in Celsius, that means something. That's like just freezing. Zero height, that means something. It means you've got no height. Right? And like if your height is minus one foot, then I'm beneath the floor. That means something. So interval um, uh, levels are things like Fahrenheit, where zero has no meaning, ratio is everything else. That's the best thing. Why do we care? Because it's difficult to divide interval numbers. We tend not to get the same kind of meaning. So the kinds of math we can do with each of these things changes. I said that several times, and I'm sure you're sick of hearing it, but you're going to forget it, and most people in the world forget it. In fact, I've seen top-level scientists dividing ordinal scales and making ridiculous conclusions. I've done it knowingly, just because I knew that no one else was going to figure it out, so I'm going to publish this thing and tell anybody. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's that. Okay, this is a summary of the kinds of math you can do on these kinds of scales. Okay, when you're developing a database, and at some point in your life you will, whether it's like keeping track of the stuff in your house, or maybe you're planning a wedding, or maybe you're actually doing research, a database tends to be like a spreadsheet of stuff. Or if you're doing research and someone gives you, here's a database of uh, a survey we did of the student population, their opinions on this and that, and you have their ages, their genders, how many years of schooling they've got, and we need to analyze that data. Some measurements of quality are important. Most commonly, how much missing data is there? Every data has missing data, every single one. Sometimes we don't have um, uh, a birth date for somebody or the age of somebody. Oh, I've got a story for you. Oh, here's this story. So I used to be a telephone surveyor for Decima Research, the country's biggest uh, surveyor. I think I told my staff students this before you probably heard this story before. So, um, and these surveys are long, like 45 minutes long, sometimes 90 minutes. So it's really hard to get people to finish them because you're calling them randomly from across the country. Right? So we, I forgot the topic of this survey, but I finally got a guy who's willing to do the entire survey. At the end of the survey, you ask them demographic questions. And nobody wants to give that information up, because why you say it for a last. I need to know your name and your address. I have your phone number. Why? Because my supervisor needs to know that you're a real person. I didn't make this up. So the guy says, I, I want to give you my answer. Right, give me, give me a, a secret code then. I don't really care. He says, okay, MX2748. Fine, MX2748. A couple hours later, my supervisor tells me, you forgot to ask this guy question 48. You better call him back again. So I call him back, and I get his wife. I don't know what to say. I said, can I speak to MX2478? <laughs> and she says, Harold, it's for you. <laughs> so that's his name, MX2478. <laughs> that's a long story to go to say that missing data is important. <laughs> Oh, I've had other cases where like, I'm like 99 questions through a 100 uh, question survey and you get jealous spouses grabbing the phone saying, so cool, my wife, I'm dude, I'm almost done. I'm not hitting on your wife, I'm doing a survey. <laughs> it's not a good way to make a living, I don't recommend it. Anyway, so that's missing data. Other issues are consistency, and that's very, very common. So under the birth date field, some people say, hey, uh, August 12, whatever, or somebody 12 August, or something, my age is 15, or, or versus date of birth. So consistency is important. How is code is important? If, if you spend any time messing around with Excel or, any, any, or SPSS, you probably notice that there, there are um, variable field coders that allow you to express, is this numerical data? Is it text? Is it string? Is it mixed? All these things matter. Because when you start doing math on large data sets, these things will screw you up fast. Do you have a unique identifier? Critical, 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 critical. So, you each have a unique identifier. You assume it's your name. It's not your name because there are like three Lakshmi Patels in the room or something like that, right? But your social security number is your unique identifier in, um, in Canada. Um, every database needs one because we need to be able to link with other databases. 
So the hospital will have your OHIP number and your diagnoses. The lab will have your OHIP number and the tests that you've taken. And the billing office will have your OHIP number and how much money you owe from the various tests you took. At some point, someone's got a link in for, oh, well, Bob here didn't pay 500 bucks for his MRI last week. Right, so link is important. And um, it seems obvious, but a lot of places don't have unique identifiers. So again, a particular country I was consulting with, um, helping create an HIV AIDS database, they had a series of patients with unique identifiers, and whenever the patient got um, diagnosed with HIV, they would change the unique identifiers. No, what are you doing? Now we don't know what happened beforehand. Now we think that his life began with HIV. There's no way for me to find out years beforehand what was he diagnosed with, what was he doing. So the second you change a unique identifier, you've got a whole new person. It's not cool. Quality control. So let's say um, this happens a lot. So we, have, we hire some students to data entry, a whole list of surveys we've just taken, and put them into the computer. Right? There's going to be some error. There always is. How do, you, uh, how do you control for that? You could go back and read every single one and check. That's not really feasible. So instead we tend to have like a 15 to 20% sample like a random sample and check those, okay? and that usually controls for it. But quality control is important. There are electronic versus paper databases. Have an image? I do not. Sometimes I show you an image of, um, again, a certain country I was consulting in. Their entire medical database was a series of paper files in the bathroom of the Ministry of Health. Entire nation stuff was in boxes in the bathroom. It's horrible. But that's paper databases. That's a real thing. So a computer database, that's a relatively new thing. And believe it or not, much of the world is yet to migrate to an entire electronic system. Even Canada is in the process of migrating to an electronic system. Um, there's a thing called HIS, Health Information System, that are now de rigueur. Now that allows us to track patients as they move through a system. It's epidemiologically rich. Here in Ottawa, we have a thing called BORN, the BORN database. Is a database that tracks birth outcomes for every pregnant woman in Ontario. This is revolutionary. This is allowing us to figure out, well, if you have a birth defect, what is your likely history coming into this? Or if you went through IVF, what, what are the outcomes of the IVF process? It seems like obvious stuff now, but it took us a long time to put the infrastructure together. Okay, flat files versus relational databases. You can define them here. But the difference is this. A flat file is like an Excel spreadsheet. It's just an x-axis and a y-axis. Every row represents a person in the database. Every column represents a variable. Maybe it's a hospital database. Every row is a patient, and maybe one column is their name, unique identifier, postal code, their diagnosis, their doctor's name, whatever it might be. Easy stuff. We do math quite easily on flat files. When I'm linking that flat file to other flat files, that's a relational database. So as I said earlier, I can link you know, your diagnosis database to the billing database using your OHIP number. Now I've got two, just picture two Excel files, right? I have an Excel file showing your OHIP number and all of your medical stuff. I have another Excel file showing your OHIP number and all your billing information. I can link those now. Once I start linking flat files, we have a relational database. That's what this is. I can't really do math that easily on a relational database. So what we do usually is we convert the data we need into another flat file and do math on that. So what I do is like get one from here, one from here, one from here, create a whole new thing. So keep, be aware that there are uh, pointy-headed nerdy types doing this on your behalf to make sure that data gets processed accordingly. Right? So again, an Excel spreadsheet is a flat file. An example of a relational database would be like an MS Access database. If you have Access, Microsoft Access is essentially just a way of keeping track of stuff. And it's just relational files. Okay, now the fun part. Let's talk about if you want a job in this field. And who would? Look at how much fun we're having. Who wouldn't want a job in this field? We're almost done. We're done. Um, before we go further, any uh, issues regarding database stuff or my fashion sense or anything? Cool. Oh, yes, back here. Um, so, what kind of linkage do you think the flat files that create a racial database? Sorry, so like for the flat files and the relational database, um, when you're linking the two flat files, you create a racial database? No, no. The linkage 
doesn't automatically create one, but you can create one. So the linking is a conceptual link. It's the idea that I, can, I see that this flat file and that flat file have a variable in common. So that's linked in my mind. What I can do then is I can import all the variables from that one into this one and create this massive flat file, or I can say, I care about um, the postal code from this file, and I care about the MRI results from that file. And I'll extract them both and create a new file, and that's what I'm going to analyze. Okay. Good question. Yeah, right. Yeah, sort of yes. The answer is yes. And um, there's something called the ambulatory database. I've got the full name for it. Most industrialized countries maintain pretty intense surveillance systems. We'll talk more about surveillance systems later in the semester. The surveillance systems include automated data dumps from publicly funded institutions. So the ambulatory databases are, are records of what happens when we walk into hospitals and the triage nurse takes her information is, and, and all that stuff. The kinds of stuff that, that's on that database that is quote unquote publicly available are things like um, what did you complain about when you arrived, meaning you know, I've got a rash in my whatever, and um, what I was diagnosed with, and what the outcome was. So simple things like that are retained by the Public Health Agency of Canada for epidemiological purposes. Yes. All that stuff is, all the, we call that tombstone stuff. All that stuff is available because those are critical variables for analysis. Right. Um, not all countries have that. But again, the industrialized ones do. We do it. The Americans do it. And you can actually go to Health Canada website, probably, definitely the American website, you can do so, and look up ambulatory health data. And it should be there. Anything else? Good questions. Right on. All right. So um, if you are seeking employment in this field, and if you're not, think about it anyway, because it's a rewarding career full of uh, attractive, interesting people. Um, if you do a quick search for like epidemiology positions on monster.com, you'll find things like this. Surveillance analyst. So again, looking at the database you just talked about, that surveillance data. Clinical monitor. These are people who work um, in clinical environments, monitoring the outcomes of randomized controlled trials. That's obviously not an epidemiologist, but we'll take the money. That's good. Um, uh, higher uh, administrative tasks as well. I won't go through all of these, but you see here health outcomes. Health outcomes is an epidemiological term often associated with pharmacovigilance. Pharmacovigilance is this process of keeping track of the effects of drugs. So every drug company has a pharmacovigilance office. The government has a pharmacovigilance office. This requires epidemiological skills. SAS programmer, I mentioned SAS as a, uh, um, a stats tool, right? That's, you'll never be unemployed if you have strong SAS bearing. Here's an example from five years ago. Senior public health epidemiologist in Toronto. Uh, what are the skills you need? You need expert communication interpersonal skills. You need to be able to write and edit. This will be a recurring theme that will shock you. The need to write and edit. Infectious disease surveillance specialist. What do you need? You need uh, health information, resource allocation. Is there writing here too? Probably. Epidemiology resident advisor in South Africa. What do we need here? Four years of additional training, master of public health, uh, uh, knowledge, skills, abilities, whatever it is, right? You get the idea. Now, amazingly, um, working for the city in the U.S. pays nothing. It's crappy. Right? It's the city of New York. If you can't live on that in New York. I don't know what's that about. <laughs> but usually it's a fairly well paying position. And you get the idea. So, good communication skills. This is a recurring theme writing skills. Where to find these positions? Endless search engines are dedicated to this particular field. You have professional organizations. CSAB is the Canadian Society for Epidemiology and Biostatistics. SER is the Society for Epidemiological Research in the USA. There are so many networking opportunities. In fact, no matter what you're going to do in your life, I think um, networking is critical to build your career opportunities. You can't rely on just applying for things. Uh, I maintain a list of um, uh, health care job search engines. We click on links on my website. I haven't updated it in years because I have a job, but um, most of them work. So feel free to zip through there if you want. 
We at the CSCB, CSCB again is the Canadian Society for Epidemiology and Biostatistics. This is an old slide. The National Conference will not be in Newfoundland. In fact, this year we have the Student Conference coming up at Lakehead in Thunder Bay. I'm looking forward to Thunder Bay. Nobody else seems to be. Thunder Bay is an interesting place. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to going. Probably sometime in May. Um, we have lots of things for students to do. Um, if you want to do an episode for a podcast, that's something that goes in your resume, it's kind of fun to do. If you want to work with our local branch here at the University of Ottawa, you're welcome to do so as well as that. The, I, I won't show this video right now, but this is a video showing the Epidemiology Research Center in the Caribbean and the work that they do there. Um, the Canadian government runs something called the Canadian Field Epidemiology Program, which any um, graduate student or graduate can apply to. And this is the fun stuff. This is where you do outbreak investigation. Um, this is a team of people if there's like some bizarre disease popping up some strange place in the country, you're flown there to investigate and to initiate quarantines and figure out the, um, the dynamics of the disease. It's very competitive, but it, uh, if that appeals to you, it's an opportunity for you. The American version is even cooler. The American version accepts one or two non-Americans every year. You get a military passport. They fly you in a black cap helicopter to parts of the world where bizarre hemorrhagic fevers are breaking out. So um, it's more dangerous and more exciting. Very competitive, but do be aware that the opportunities exist. Uh, yeah, let me see here. The WHO is, of course, the national, the, the global center for epidemiological things. They maintain fact sheets, a lot of global health information, and they publish something called the Weekly Epidemiology Report. If you want to keep abreast of disease outbreaks around the world, that's where you go. So you go there and read about the WER, um, position papers on vaccines, and so forth. Uh, sounds exciting. Not really. It doesn't sound exciting at all, I know, but it is. It is kind of interesting. CDC is the mecca for epidemiology, the Centers for Disease Control. You can watch a video of what they do, the tracking network, and how they respond to outbreaks. And it's a place to aspire to if this career appeals to you. And that is all, my friends. We'll stop there because I see you're all fading. That's Friday night.